But now I'd like to also introduce Hamid Ali, um, who writes under the pen name A.H. Almas. He was born in Kuwait in 1944, and at the age of 18, he moved to the U.S. to study at the University of California in Berkeley. Hamid was working on his Ph.D. in physics when he reached a turning point in his life and destiny that led him to inquire into the psychological and spiritual aspects of human nature rather than the physical nature of the universe. He left the academic world to pursue an in-depth journey of inner discovery, applying his scientific precision and discipline to personal experiential research. This included study with different teachers and different modalities, extensive reading and continuous study of his own consciousness in an effort to understand the essential nature of human experience and reality in general. Hamid's process of exploration led to the creation of the Ritwan School and with Karen Johnson resulted in the founding and unfoldment of the Diamond Approach. He's an author of over 19 books and um, he's here with, for this final lecture with us. Hello and welcome, Hamid. Over to you. Thank you, Daniela. Good to be with everybody. We're coming to the end of the road. The last lecture has its purposes, the uh, reason why I thought about them. One of the main purposes is to help clarify some of the misunderstanding and incompleteness in the understanding, especially in the West, of various teachers and teachings. And also to show that they're really teaching different things, that the spiritual, human spirituality is rich, and it's not like they're all teaching about the same thing. It's not like a different perspective and the same realization. No, they're actually different realization. They're experiencing reality differently. And Dogen will show us this more than anybody, any of the one before. Um, <clears throat> I have talked about uh, the Sagadatta Maharaj, Krishnamurti, these are two individual, two teachers, and Dogen is the third teacher, and uh, spent some time on uh, Advaita Vedanta, which is a spiritual tradition, and uh, absorption, especially in the way that Garab Dorja, its founder, has formulated it in its simple three essential points. That was the last talk we did. So Dogen is unusual, actually, in relationship to all those other teachers, because he's so different. And we will see how different he is. And he shows us different ways enlightenment can be, or realization can be, that none of the others can capture it. Not like he's better or worse, or, and no, it's just different. He lived in the 13th century, and, uh, and he taught in Japan, of course, and he had his monasteries and his students, and, and, uh, and but he uh, both taught, lectured, and written, and his writing has become an important uh, Japanese literature. And my previous lecture, the aim uh, was I was addressing the people and though in the previous lecture, I was addressing the, the individual interested in those teachers or, or teaching or involved in, the, in those teaching. Here and talk about Dogen, I have a different aim. I'm not addressing it specifically to Zen students. I'm addressing it to a spiritual community at large because the spiritual community at large is ignorant of Dogen, does not know Dogen. Dogen is not that widely known 
and spiritual circles. You hear about non-dual teaching, you hear about Dzogchen these days, Advaita Vedanta, Sufism, whatever. Dogen is rarely mentioned except among uh, Zen students and teachers. So, and Zen had its heyday a few decades ago when Zen was the big thing in, this, in the West. These days, Zen sort of has receded in the background and what is more foreground these days is like Tibetan Buddhism, Advaita Vedanta, stuff like that. Although Zen is still there, quite active. So my intention is to introduce Dogen to our modern or postmodern uh, spiritual circles in the West. And uh, because I think he, ha he has a lot to offer, uh, many kinds of realization and spiritual insight not common in spiritual circles these days. They are not only important, but many of them are relevant for our time. And also quite corrective to the spirituality commonly known these days. One way I, of differentiating, different, making a distinction, I've been thinking about, I'm not going to go into this uh, much, but it's, uh, I woke up one morning with this image in my mind that most of those other teachings look at reality as an onion, which is, has, you know, you could keep peeling and get to the depth of it. Dogen teaching is reality is more like a turnip, doesn't have layers, just what it is. And that might be a very important actually metaphor to show the difference between what Dogen emphasizes and what most of the other te all the other teaching I've discussed so far talk about. I will discuss some of the teaching of Dogen that I know or understand only from direct experience. I won't discuss anything I don't understand from my own experience. If I don't have an experience that I think is what Dogen is talking about, I won't mention it. I won't talk about it. For Dogen has many kind of things he taught that I don't understand. And so I'm not going to talk about them. Also, I'll be giving my understanding of these things he taught, not the commonly known, because there's no commonly known understanding of many things that Dogen taught because his teaching, teachings are enigmatic and even Zen masters, some of them understand them differently or give them different kind of interpretation. So, and Dogen has many, interpreters, many commentaries, many scholarly studies, and all of them have their own interpretations of what did he mean by saying these things? Because his writing, although he wrote, he wrote essays, but it's like each essay is like a common, each sentence like a common, difficult to understand if you really don't have the experience. And some of them you don't understand, not only the experience, he uses Zen language, which has a whole long history of tradition. So it has many metaphors and stories and all are unfolded in, 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 of course, in, uh, in Koan. You can't understand a Koan, try to solve it just by reading the Koan because it has a lot of history. It's built with many other things. And you have to know many things before you can really even be able to delve into it. And uh, some of what Dogen rights are like that, steeped in the tradition. So part of this introduction I'm making is a discussion of kinds of realization he taught that show us the amazing potential of spirituality, which can expand our spiritual horizons beyond what we have envisioned so far beyond what we have learned in the previous lectures I've given at least so far, which really spanned a great deal of our spirituality, humankind at the present time. 
usually for most people, many places, uh, there's a tendency to know one teaching or tradition and end up believing it is the only valid view or experience of reality. And believing that other teaching are simply just either different interpretation and different way of saying it, or some are better, some are not. I'm showing here that it is a story, a different story here. I want to show, emphasize a wider view of spiritual, spirituality and spiritual practice. His main written work is called the Shobo Genzo, uh, translated Tragedy of the True Dharma I. It's a big book. I have actually two big volumes, I think. And uh, it's considered by now a Japanese classic. It's supposedly very beautiful. I don't speak, read English, Japanese. And otherwise, it would be nice to read it. Just like people who read Rumi in the original, it's quite different than reading Rumi in the English. But the interesting thing that Dogen, from what I know from people who read uh, the Shobogenzo, that it has in it Chinese, not just Japanese, because Dogen mixed the two languages because he studied, he went to China to study. He had his teacher, Rojang, in China, his master. And the Shobogenzo, each chapter is called the fascicle. And there's a big book, and many smaller books have to come out with some of these fascicles written, translated by different translators. And there are many commentaries of them. The I will start with the fascicle called Uji, the one of the most famous. And the usual translation is time being. Uji it has to do with time, it has to do with being. So translate time being. I don't think it's a literal translation because probably there's no exact English equivalent. So first I will read, I quote, some parts of this fascicle. I'm not going to begin from the big, I'm not going to read from the beginning. I'm going to choose and pick part that I want to discuss. For the time being here means Time is being, and all being is time. Then he says, the way the self arrays itself is the form of the entire world. See each thing in this entire world as a moment of time. Things do not hinder each other, just as moment do not hinder one another. Know that in this way, there are myriads of forms and hundreds of grasses throughout the entire earth, and yet each grass in each form itself is the entire earth. Then another piece of this fascicle, since there is nothing but just this moment, the time being is all the time there is. Grass being, form being are both time. Each moment is all being, is the entire world. Reflect now whether any being or any world is let, left out of the present moment. There's a translation from the moon from a book called Moon and a Doodrop, translated, translated by Kasawaki Tanahashi, who is the main translator of Dogen, who lives here at Berkeley. Now it's an interesting kind of uh, view about being and time, space and time because it's <laughs> very different from what we've been discussing, like in Advaita Vedanta or Nisargadatta uh, uh, or uh, even Garabdorja and Sogchen. 
Because in all these teachings, being is beyond both time and space. Being, if being is taken to be the true nature of thing, is beyond time and space. But Dogen is saying something new about time and space in relation to reality. Something not referred to by the usual non dual teaching, like those of Advaita Vedanta or Dzogchen, the topic of the last two lectures. So he, Dogen, emphasis is on time, which we will see will go through much of his teaching. Not all of it, but lots of it is really has to do with based on this fascicle being time. A time being. Because most teaching talk about timeless awareness or infinite consciousness. When they talk about time, they talk about going beyond time. That non dual awareness, like in Advaita Vedanta or Dzogchen, is beyond time and it's a timelessness or pure nowness. However, Dogen sees, he doesn't go beyond time. He looks at time differently. He sees everything as time. In fact, in Uji, he equates time to being, which means being mean the being of everything or everything is being. This way, including time, space. But for him, even space is time. So things don't happen in time or bring brought about by time, they are time. This is a radical view of reality and reveals how dynamic everything is. See, if we look at this vasicle about time and being and how any form, any piece of grass is all of being, which means everything. Each moment is all being in the entire world, he says. When he says world, he meant the whole universe, not just the earthly world. The show, this is not uncommon in Zen because Zen includes some of the teaching that comes of the Chinese philosophy called the Huayan. Huayan has this view about emptiness, which is very different from the way that Tibetan have taken it, which is that emptiness for them means uh, lack of obstruction. Nothing obstructs anything else. As Dogen said, just like each moment doesn't obstruct another, like the present, the present doesn't obstruct the past, the present doesn't obstruct the future. One moment is not in the way of another moment. He said, nothing obstructs, even each thing does not obstruct another. And the way the Hawaiian took it, understand it, which is experientially verified that the entire universe can be experienced as in one place, one thing, like one blade of grass contain the totality of the universe. And not only the totality of the universe includes all of time. Blade of grass or each moment, each moment includes all moments, includes all of time and everything at each time. So that's a lot. I mean, a kind of unity that is very different from non-dual unity. The non-dual unity is extended. It's everything is, is, is a consciousness that is big and infinite and contains everything in the now. For Dogen, this realization, is not like there's a big thing, like this big awareness that contains everything, no. Each thing 
It doesn't even have to be a spiritual thing, a blade of grass or uh, or a flower or uh, or any activity includes everything. Have the totality of all the universe in it. It is a kind of realization that is very different from non-dual non realization. But I mean, sometimes people call it non-dual, but that's not the non-dual that uh, Advaita Vedanta or Dzogchen mean by non-dual. When they say non-dual, they mean the, the true nature, the, uh, in this case, the, the consciousness or the awareness is not separate from all everything else and everything else is nothing separate from each other. They're all interconnected because they're all made out of the same awareness. Dogen is not concerned about infinite consciousness or pure awareness and all of that. He rarely actually discuss, uses those expressions. Uh, he does this mention awareness once in a while, but it's not his concern. His concern is each particular. So this is one, the first realization I'm mentioning that he brings in an OG, which is a kind of, and I call it unilocal unity. Unilocal mean all local, local, lo, localization and time space are in one location. And this location is not a location because all, you know, there is no time and space and the way you usually know them. And he called that a moment of time. So each moment time contains all time, but all time, each time includes all being, as he said. Because each, he said, time is being, which is being mean everything. Another quote he, he, from another fascicle to say something about time, <clears throat> which I will discuss later. He wrote, if you wish to know Buddha nature, which I call you your true nature, he said, you should know that it is precisely temporal conditions themselves. I mean, when you hear Tibetan Lama saying that, Temporal conditions mean what is happening at this moment, this moment, and whatever it is, is Buddha nature. Buddha nature for Buddhists is something spiritual, is a pure light or pure awareness or pure emptiness. Another writer, you know, he, John, John Stamble, her book, Impermanence of Buddha Nature, says it is not the case that there is some universal thing, form or substance called time, of which all sentient beings and Buddhas are individuation. Everything, including ourself, is just its moment of taking place or presencing. So time is not like there is something called time. No, it's the very moment of arising. It's the presencing itself as this very moment. That is what's called time here. So not, time is not made into a spiritual something. It is just any moment. Each moment, however, the spiritual thing about it, it includes all other moments. Let's move on to another fascicle that he calls the bright pearl, which is a thing related to the time being, the OG, in terms of the teaching, but it brings out other things. This uh, fasting called One Bright Pearl, it came from history, from something that Zwansha, the great master Zhongji of Mount Zwansha in China taught. 
So Hidogan writes, some years after attending the way, Zwansha instructed his students saying, the entire world of the 10 direction is just one bright pearl. So there are very discussions and interpretation meaning what, what, what does he mean? The entire world, 10 direction is just one bright pearl. Entire world means everything. Dogen right, didn't right. The meaning is that the entire world in the 10 direction is neither vast nor minute, neither square nor round. It is neutral, not active, and not obvious. From this, I take to mean this shows that the world cannot be given spatial dimension or shapes. And so far, this part doesn't say anything about time, it just says it has no shape because space is, uh, is seen here as a concept and this teaching is beyond the concept of space. To say everything is infinite is space. To say everything is expanded and expands is space, which means the concept of space is still there, which many other teachings still adhere to. He just recognizes it as a concept. So you cannot say the entire world is vast or small. Here, he, in the same fashion, he continues from a book that I, I didn't mention. That I got this from a book called Beyond Thinking. He continues to say, one bright pearl is not yet a name, but an expression of understanding. Although there have been people who thought it was only a name, one bright pearl directly experiences 10,000 years. But the entire past has not yet departed. The entire present is just now arriving. Here is the now of the body and here is the now of the mind. This is the bright pearl. It is not limited to grass and trees here and, and there, or even to mountains and rivers in the universe. So he's saying it's also the one bright pearl, not only all space, all the world, because the world is, doesn't have the concept of space in all this time, because time too doesn't have an extension. So you, as you see, it is connected to the Uji or the time being. But another way I understand it, although this is the usual understanding, interpretation of one bright pearl that the Zwan Shah said, the whole entire universe and all time is one bright pearl. And he, he says it doesn't mean it's big or small or square or round. And it's a unity that is kind of can't be experienced. This is not intellectual, you see. It's, it is an actual experience. He's talking about his realization. I also think, as my own interpretation, that beside that, when he says that the bright pearl is also all the world, all of men experience or realize as a bright pearl of no size, I think he literally sometimes meant it. I wouldn't be surprised if he saw the entire universe as one bright pearl. And that's a whole other thing. Zen doesn't usually get into that. He doesn't say that explicitly, but I think it's possible to see it that way. We'll move on now to another fascicle. So, so far, I've been talking about space and time and the kind of realization that integrated the Hawaiian philosophy, which is that all space time it can be seen not to have a size or duration. All each moment is all moment, one point, all points. And basically, what Hawaiian says 
is all points in time space are one point, one thing, one little thing includes all points of time and space. And that can be experienced, actually. We can experience oneself as being the totality of all time and space. And this fascicle called the Kenjo Koan, which means actualizing the fundamental point, somewhat related to the question of time, but more of time in relation to causality. So time, when we think of time, we think of causality. This is an interesting one. I like this one. He says, <clears throat> firewood becomes ash and does not become firewood again. Yet do not suppose that the ash is future and firewood past. Because that's how most people look at it. You should understand that firewood abides in the phenomenal expression of firewood, which fully includes past and future and is independent of past and future. Ash abides in the phenomenal expression of ash, which fully includes future and past. Just as firewood does not become firewood again after it is ash, you do not return to birth after death. That's a very interesting fascicle. And it's basically, it is built on the Uji actually, but it says something else about, because if you take time and com compress it all in one point, one instant, the question of stream of time, things happen in time, and one thing follows another, bringing the causality, one cause another. So if you burn firewood, it become ash. You said, yes, fire become ash. However, you cannot say that firewood is the cause of ash. Ash is just ash because it is ash is its own thing. That is an important part of his realization. Whatever it is, it is its own thing. I mean, and there is in Buddhism, the understanding of what is called uh, relativity, which is that each thing is relative to other thing and uh, and called sometimes uh, dependent origination. They cannot take one thing and, and the thing is what it is. It's always related and understood in relation to other thing. And although he doesn't agree with this, he comes in with something different, which is radical, which is you can understand ash, you can know ash as ash, without thinking of wood. Ash doesn't come from wood. Ash is just ash comes from the world of ash. Just as wood is wood and cannot, does not need to be related to trees, does not relate, need to be related to ash. Because everything is usually, we understand it and relate it to other things. And he has a uh, kind of realization where each thing is understood for what it is without having uh, relay being related to other things. It is what it is. So he says, ash abides in the phenomenal expression of ash. But the thing is that this ash includes all future and all past, includes all of time. So even though it's independent of time, because it is not caused by the burning of the, of the wood, it at the same time includes all of time and space. So it includes the thing that Oji says, but brings in another thing, which is elimination of causality. He does not say that causality has no place. He just says there is another way of experiencing things. When we are purely experiencing something, 
totally recognizing it, being it, realizing it. Everything is its own thing. That's what I meant by turnip. Doesn't have layers, it is what it is. Causality implies linear time, which for Dogen is only one way of knowing time. This thing, that everything is what it is, is somewhat similar to something that Krishnamurti said when he said the fact of something, the fact, just the fact of what it is. He had that experience, a similar to and actually is one of the only other people I discuss who comes close to this kind of understanding. But he didn't isolate it as a specific realization. So the realization here is that usually we know something by relating it to other things. That's how we know everything related to other things. Here he says, you know something just in itself. Now, this is similar to uh, spiritual uh, qualities. We know a spirituality, it's called the knowledge is noses. You know by being something. When you know pure awareness, you know awareness by awareness, knowing awareness, not by relating it to other things that are not awareness. The same thing, you know love as love, not by relating it to hatred or jealousy. No, love is love and you know it as love. So you know it, the knowing of it is independent of contrasting it with other things. That is how spiritual qualities are known. Here, however, Dogen, and going further, he's not talking about spiritual qualities. He's talking about ordinary things like ash and wood. So the thing that spiritual teaching know about spiritual qualities, he's bringing it and saying it also applies to about anything, any ordinary thing. Applies to your body, applies to hair on your head, applies to a blade of grass, applies to ash, apply to wood, apply to a mountain. So it doesn't have to be present, consciousness, awareness, light, all of that can be anything. And we could know it as it is. Zen tend to relate to that as the suchness of things, knowing something in its suchness. He uses the word suchness sometimes, but not much as others that masters. You see, in all of this, when he says that ash contains all of past, all the future, he doesn't say it's timeless, which is what Nanda will say that everything is timeless. The, the ash and the wood all exist in the timeless awareness. He's not saying that. He, he, there's no mention of timeless awareness here or expanded awareness. The wood is just wood itself. And so it's not like the onion uh, metaphor where there are layers. You repeat one layer after another until you get to the depth of thing. So the usual teaching, most te spiritual teaching, like the Randall teaching, there is the apparent and there is the hidden. And this a spiritual thing is hidden by the apparent. If you take the apparent, you become ego self. If you go to the uh, hidden true nature, and then you become realization. For Dogen, there is no apparent hidden. What you see is what you get. To ash is ash. He's not talking about the nature of ash as something else. No, ash is ash. And for, for him, that is purity of realization. Now, this fascicle about wood and ash 
he related some, something that comes close to our experience that touches us more. He said, this is being so, it is an established way in the Buddha Dharma to deny that birth turns into death. By birth, he doesn't mean just the moment of born, he, he meant life. Accordingly, birth is understood as no birth. Birth is an expression complete this moment. Death is an expression complete at this moment. They are like winter spring. You do not call, call winter the beginning of spring or summer the end of, sp of spring. In other words, death is not the end of life which he refers to as birth, or death and birth are not the end and the beginning of life. They are each its own thing, again, related to Zen suchness. So when you understand life, life is life in the moment, this moment is life. It is not constituted to death. Death is death is death is death. It's not just the end of life. Death is its own thing. If we recognize, if we have that kind of realization, that question of being afraid of death, all of that is irrelevant. Because the death is not seen as the end of something. You have to be really in the moment for that to happen. You have to be sort of in what's called a timelessness and the now, but however, this timelessness, this now includes all of time. That's the interesting thing about it. It's like takes all the past, all the fear, puts it all in the now, and, and, and whatever thing you're experiencing includes all of that. Like in your heart, if you're feeling your heart, your heart has in it all the time, and all the beings of all the time. And everything is what it is. Death is death. Life is life. Ash is ash. Wood is wood. And each one of them, even though it is itself, it contains the totality of the universe. You don't have to be an expanded infinite something to be contained the totality of the universe. He is not against that non-dual view. He might actually mention sometime, I don't know. I mean, I haven't read him, read everything he, he's written, but he, his realizations is about those things. He makes these things very clear, which, which is, I think, is quite an addition and opening up the spiritual uh, view to some other ways of experiencing the thing. He makes ordering things become sublime. We will see more about this. Another thing in, the, in this fascicle is the kind of realization that Dogen frequently discusses. As I said, it's different from non-dual teaching, different from Suvi teaching, Kabbalistic teaching which emphasize the explicit manifestation of spiritual nature as light or radiance. Not that he doesn't mention light or radiance. He does mention it sometimes, but when he's talking about ash, he's not talking about light or radiance. He means ash. Now he's talking about, now he's going to talk about self and realization. He writes, to carry yourself forward and experience the myriad things is delusion. But that is how most people experience things. To carry yourself forward, your, your, your is you and you're experiencing the, the world. He said that is the way of delusion. Then the next sentence, that myriad things come forth and experience themselves is awakening. Everything as it is 
experiencing itself as it is, is awakening. It is not the self that, that experiences these things. No, these things are can be there without the self experiencing them. But I will explain more. That comes more clear in the further thing. Sometimes he talks about self and meaning the ego self. Sometimes he talks about self in the sense of real, the realization. He calls it self in the big S. So all the myriad things are the true self then. But remember, all the myriad things, all the world, they're not, he's not talking about all the things as awareness or as presence. He's not talking about the Brahman or the Dharmakaya. He's talking, no, things of the world. So he has a, again, he's pretty concrete. He's pretty concrete and gives ordinary things of the world an ultimacy, instead of the ultimacy being of infinite consciousness or awareness. In this quote I just said, he said that the myriad thing come forth. He doesn't say that the myriad thing comes forth as the self. He said they come forth as awakening. Come forth and experience themselves is awakening. Sometimes he talks about the self, sometimes there is no mention of self. I take this to mean he is referring to two kinds of realization. One is the entire universe as the self. And the other, the entire universe is simply experiencing itself with no self of any kind in this realization. I find both, he refers to both in different times. And some people take these to mean the, mean the same thing. I take them to be two different things. They experience every, I am everything. You can see I, there is an I as being the myriad things, the whole totality of the universe. But sometimes there's just the myriad things. There's no self there. Myriad things just being themselves with nobody experiencing them or being them. And they're not referred to as self. Now we see this more clearly in the, next, in the same fascicle in the next uh, paragraph. This is one of the most famous things he that are well known. <clears throat> to study the Buddha way, way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Now he is a, a small self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind as well as body and minds of others drop away. No trace of realization remains and this no trace continues endlessly. That's a very famous part of the fascicle. We see here that realization is not a matter of realizing pure awareness or consciousness, but being the myriad things. So it is being everything and their particularity. Now, somebody, some people can, uh, well, if, if the, I am the myriad thing or the myriad things appearing as awakening, does that mean they are non-dual with each other? Are they separate from each other? I mean, just like, you know, so how is it different from other, most people? Everything is there. 
Well, the question of them being separate or not separate is simply irrelevant in this realization because the concept of separateness is absent. In non-dual realization, there is the concept of being separate or not separate. So non-duality really has the concept of non-duality with non-separateness. In this realization of the myriad thing being them, themselves, that is an irrelevant question to say if things are separate or not separate. They're neither separate nor not separate. But does reality say about itself, things are separate or not separate? No, it's a human mind that does that. So the myriad things are neither separate nor not separate. The question of separateness is simply relevant to such subtle but amazing realization of freedom. I go on to another thing related to this being the myriad things. Being the myriad thing or the myriad thing presenting themselves as awakening. And it's an important thing for me. I, I noticed that in different places. Sometimes that is referred to as the myriad thing as the self the, with a big S. And some things just the myriad things are experiencing themselves. Although some people think, no, they're both refer to the self, the subtle self or the universal self that then some people think, I think, well, sometime, sometime actually there's no self. No self without it being the selflessness uh, that is known other spiritual experiences when you're experiencing pure awareness that doesn't have a self. And in, in the, in the Advaita Vedanta, the, the pure, infinite expanse of consciousness is called the self, that's the big self. In Buddhism, the pure awareness is empty. It's called no self. That's non-dual Buddhism. Here, what do you call it? A dual, non-dual? Neither, really. He goes on here, you see, when he talks about the myriad things, he is emphasizing the particularity of each thing. He said the myriad thing. He doesn't say everything, you know. I, I want to go on to the question of particularity, which is uh, something important in Zen in general, but for Dog in particular, which is the, the kind of realization of single thing. He mentioned a piece of grass, a moment, all these are single thing, not just the totality of thing. And this fascicle called Gabio or painting of a rice cake. That's the, it's called the fascicle, painting of a rice cake. An interesting fascicle in this totality that I'm using part of it. He says, the total experience of a single thing does not deprive the thing of its own unique particularity. It, it places a thing neither against others or against none. To place a thing against none is another form of dualistic abstraction. When total experience is realized unobstructedly, the total experience of a single thing is the same as the total experience of all things. A single total experience is a single thing in its totality. A total experience of a single thing is one with that of all things. He brings it again. The, the Hawaiian view that each thing contains all things. However, he is emphasizing a single thing. The single thing, <laughs> in the experience of a single thing, single thing is experienced totally, or the realization has full exertion. Sometimes he gives that expression. We see that the realization can be of a particle thing, not all things, myriad things appear in the totality of the universe appearing, experiencing themselves, or the totality of the universe appearing as the real self, 
but uh, just one thing. It's very important then, and he makes it very clear here. We see that the realization can be of a particular thing, not only all myriad thing. This is far cry from most non-dual teaching about the same, sameness of all particulars, where the uniqueness of the particle is not only minimized, but completely ignored. It's also different from the Sufi Kabbalistic experience, the unity of being. The question of unity or its lack is simply irrelevant for many of the realizations that Dogen taught. Because the, his the unity is a different kind of unity. It's not the unity of the vastness, it's the unity of the single. The, what I just uh, read uh, from Gab, Gabio, the painting of rice, rice cake, was a translation from uh, He Jin Kim, one of people who comments on him in his book, A High Dog and Mystical Realist. Now I'll give you a translation from Tanahashi, his main translator. He said, to penetrate one thing does not take away its inherent characteristics. Just as penetration does not limit one thing, it does not make one thing unlimited. To try to make it unlimited is a hindrance, which you allow, when you allow penetration to be unhindered by penetration, one penetration is myriad penetration. One penetration is one thing. Penetrating one thing is penetrating myriad things. This translation shows that a thing, a particular thing does not lose its inherent characteristic, which gives it its uniqueness when it is fully realized. Total experience or penetration, one says total experience, one says penetration is really two ways of saying the same thing, which is to realize the particular, to see it as truly as it truly is. Te Dogen has many teaching about realizing the particular or full experience or penetration of the particular. Just sometimes being the particular where there is no duality between one and the thing. I give you another quote. When a person verifies in practice the Buddha way, attaining one thing, he or she become thoroughly familiar with that one thing. Encountering one activity, he or she practices that one activity. Since this is where the place is and the way it achieves its circulation, the reason that the limits of what is knowable are not known is that this knowing arises and proceeds together with the exhausting, the exhaustive fathoming of the Buddha Dharma. It's a different person interpreting it. You talk about being familiar with one thing or an activity, and one thing can be in one activity, like uh, drinking tea or walking. Walking is walking, and walking is not related to any other thing, not related to sitting, not related to our body moving, walking is walking. It is the suchness of walking. Sometimes it is not even oneness with the particular, but simply the particular and its factness. Because sometimes it seems he writes as if one is that particular. He, one and the particular are the same thing. And the particular becomes the true self then. But sometimes there is no self. This is just the factness of the particular. We see this from what Kim writes about uh, as part of this discussion of Dogen's view of practice and enlightenment. 
In Dogen's view, the samadhi of self-fulfilling activity in its absolute purity was such that our daily activities are undefiled by and unattached to the stick categories, events, and things that our perception and intellect create, all the, while, all the while living with the usual those dualities. The dualistic world remains real, not dissolved. Therefore, the unity in question does not replace dualities, but unobstructed by them. Levi leaves order things as they are. However, they are not seen from the perspective of the dualistic self, which is the ordinary self. There is no self here. He goes on. By naming specific individuals and events, Dogen indicates passage through the independent aspect of dharmas. Time is not separate from being, and time and being are two sides of an event. Dharmas are both a being time and a being, and all being time. They are. Each dharma is time, which is being, and each dharma, which means each thing, is all being time. All the be all sp space and time and the beings in it, as embodied in each being time. A person is empty of a fixed identity and ununiversal, yet simultaneously function as a particular being time. The problem arises when we try to fix these states as sequential and separate. Passage is life as process, not as life fixed and unexplicated. We see here that Dogen's reference to particulars does not place them in what non-dual teaching called doer or non-dual. It is neither. This gives an alternative to seeing our ordinary experience as only dual, which can only move to dual. So if we see it as dual, we move to non-dual. For him, he does not move to non-dual because he is not removing one layer going to the next layer is he he's, he's seeing the same thing that we call it dual and see it for what it is without the self and then it appears in its suchness in its true condition and its uniqueness some of us might be confused with all the quotation i mean dogan himself is difficult to understand his quotations and of course, the commentary, especially if there are commentaries by the scholars like Kim, for instance, they sound philosophical, they are philosophical. But the main thing I wanted to say that for him, the question of that realization is you can realize that you are the totality of the universe without that totality being pure awareness or present is just the totality of the universe. Or you, your realization can be of a single thing. The single thing is you, or the, uh, or the single thing is you, that's one realization. The other one, a single thing is just a single thing. And it is, it is precious and it is clear for what it is. And that is awakening for him. So there is awakening of being everything and the awakening of everything being itself, the awakening of being a single thing, the awakening of a single thing being itself without it being related to other thing. And that the single thing, although it's unique, it includes everything. That is another, the first realization I talked about. Mm -hmm. So that sort of, sort of encapsulates most of what I said. So in case you get confused, I'm saying that, and now I'm gonna go on to other things. We'll see, there's a lot to say, and I'm not even saying everything that Dogen taught, there's taught a lot more things. Some, many of them I don't understand. <clears throat> we move on to what he, Buddha nature. 
uh, what he means by Buddha nature was a big thing in Buddhism. What is Buddha nature? The idea of Buddha nature, which arose in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, the idea of Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha. He called uh, this facet called Buddha nature or Puscho in Japanese. which is the nature of reality and, and all being. There's a quote from uh, Okumura. He said, in the Shobogunzo, Dogen writes that whole being is the Buddha nature and that e even inanimate things, grass, trees, etc. are an expression of Buddha nature. He rejected any view that saw, saw Buddha nature as a permanent, substantial inner self or ground. That mean he rejected the, the Advaita Vedanta view, which is that of the Brahman, the ultimate self. Dogen held that Buddha nature was not only vast emptiness, but also the world of becoming and that impermanence is in itself Buddha nature. That's what this uh, vascular called impermanence is Buddha nature, which is a very radical view of what is Buddha nature. Because for most te teaching, Buddha nature is like pure awareness or emptiness, if you go to the Tibetan view. Another quote. According to Dogen, therefore, the very impermanency of grass and trees, thicket and forest, is the Buddha nature. The very impermanency of men and things, body and mind, is the Buddha nature. Nature and lands, mountains and rivers, are impermanent because they are the Buddha nature. Supreme and complete enlightenment, because it is impermanent, is the Buddha nature. So Buddha nature is everything, really, including their impermanence. So it's an interesting uh, novel idea that the impermanence itself, which is a concept very well known in Buddhism, he takes that and makes it Buddha nature. Nobody, I think, before that said impermanence Buddha nature. In most teaching traditions, there is a pos positing of an ultimate or primordial nature to the individual and all of reality. This is particularly true in non-dual teaching, as we have seen in Veda Vedanta and Sakshan. It's also true in some Western teaching like those of Sufi and Kabbalistic schools. There are differences how this is true or inner nature, or inner de nature defined or experienced in different ways. In Buddhism, there is the Mahayana, and Mahayana, the notion of emptiness as ultimate, for instance, as Buddha nature. But other non-dual teaching like Mahamuddha Dzogchen understand the inner nature as empty, transparent awareness. It's in Mahayana that developed the idea of Buddha nature, Tathata Garbha. Buddha, Dogen is Buddhist, but it's difficult to see this if we contrast with, with the Tibetan view of Buddha nature and enlightenment. For instance, to give you an to, to give this more context, in uh, Vajrayana, as in Tibetan and other places, they developed two competing major views about what the ultimate nature is, what Buddha nature is. And those are called the Shantong and Rangtong view that differentiate the, the Tibetan school in general, they differentiate the two major ones. Rangtong, as we, uh, let me see. Dzogchen is considered Shantong, which considers the ultimate nature as uh, not emptiness, but empty awareness, that uh, emptiness itself cannot be the ultimate. It is a pure awareness characterized by emptiness. So it's called Rigpa or empty clear awareness, as we mentioned last lecture. 
while in the Dalai Lama school, the Galugpas, then it's more rank dog, which where the ultimate is emptiness itself. And ultimate is seen as the lack of inherent existence to all things. Just think don't exist in the ultimate way. For Zongchen, then the ultimate is the primordial expanse of awareness, which is empty. But for the Glugpa, the ultimate is the emptiness itself. Now, the clear awareness is sometimes called a concordant ultimate. Dogen does not subscribe to either, doesn't even discuss those. I don't know if he's aware of them. But before I get there, let's look at another distinction in Mahayana Buddhism that developed, that precedes the, de the development of Shantong versus Rangtong. There were two main schools about the view about true nature. Some hold the view that Buddha nature is like a seed in each individual that can grow and develop and reveal its true indestructibility and perfection in Buddhahood or enlightenment. So it's a seed that grows and develops and it is completely developed, it is, becomes what's called Buddhahood or enlightenment. But some teaching, especially the non-dual one, like Dzogchen, hold this Buddha nature as already complete and perfect and always present as beyond, beyond as the ground of all experience already completed. It's not like a seed that develops in Buddhahood. It is already completed. So one simply awakens to it. So this is the view of a Dzogchen, Mahamudra, similar to that Veda Vedanta, that reality like the Brahman is already there, you're aware of it or not. So as I said, Zakchen, I mean Dogen is not involved in these things. And his view of Buddha nature is quite novel and unique and has far reaching consequences to understanding of reality. That's why I'm bringing it up. It corresponds to his teaching of time and being. I discuss how impermanence is Buddha nature. But there are more interesting things about such understanding, which is that impermanence is Buddha nature. Because impermanence it brings in the question of time again. So I'll quote from Stambo, who John Stambo, who wrote a book about that. Where she comments and Dogen's what some of his well-known fascicles relate to that topic. She writes, Dogen tells us that Buddha nature is neither something that we always possess, nor something that first appears upon enlightenment. It is not that sentient beings are from the first endowed with Buddha nature. Here, the essential point is, even though you seek the Buddha nature, hoping to endure yourself with it, Buddha nature is not something to appear now for the first time. The important radical point here is again quoted by Stampo. The Buddha nature is not the kind of thing that we can possess at all. Viewed temporally, this means that Buddha nature is not something that admits of being possessed in the mode of durational persistence. It does not persist. It has no duration. As Dogen repeatedly emphasizes, the Buddha nature is not something potential that can be actualized akin to the growth in time of a seed. So again, the quote, as for the truth of Buddha nature, the Buddha nature is not incorporated prior to Buddhahood. It is incorporated upon the attainment of Buddhahood. The Buddha nature is always manifest simultaneously with the attainment of Buddhahood. Radical insight here that uh, Buddha nature is uh, impermanence has the corollary that Buddha nature is not 
always there in time. Because to say it is always there and, and it's waiting for you to discover it, that you are not enlightened because you're not aware of what you already are, with, which is the Buddha nature is already there with pure aware emptiness. He says, no, it is not, if to say it that way, it means it is in time. Time passes in Buddha nature. But for him, time doesn't pass in Buddha nature. Buddha nature appears the moment we recognize Buddha nature. The enlightenment is Buddha nature appearing, manifesting. Before that, they, you cannot say there was a Buddha nature someplace. It's not something that is called Buddha nature. So even though other teachings say that true nature is timeless, they say it's timeless, but then they say it's always there and you just need to awaken to it. Dogen says, no, it is not always there, for it does not endure in time. So it is always there and allowing everything is to claim it, it endures in time. For this makes time more fundamental than true nature. And it is beyond such duration and view of reality. So it arises only at the moment of enlightenment. It's a magical thing, actually. It's a very interesting thing. A related point is that non-dual and most mystical teaching, the world is a manifestation out of an ultimate ground. But here we see, for Doigon, the world is not a manifestation of something else. It presences as it is, which is implicit in what I've been saying. This takes us back to his realization of things as they are, is what reality is, his mode of suchness. No wonder that some thinkers, like in the case of he, Kim, Jim, Kim thought of him as a mystical realist. So, uh, his understanding of the world is quite different from the common view that the world is a manifestation from the ground of consciousness, awareness, or love. In fact, he takes us back to his unilocal view of reality when he says the great ultimate is the tiniest particle and tiniest particle is the great, great ultimate. So that is a very radical view about true nature or Buddha nature. Both saying that temporality itself is, and that uh, impermanence is, and then the consequence of that, that it does not exist in time. Now, non-duals will say it doesn't exist in time, but they say it's always there. I go on to another thing he called non-thinking, which is an interesting thing that I wanted to go over. It's not going to give us much time for <laughs> come on the question, but I want to give a complete picture. At least as complete as I can. And this facet called the point of Zazen, Dogen Wright. Yao Shand said, beyond thinking, the need for, for non-thinking is crystal clear, nor to think not thinking, non-thinking is always used. He bring in the idea of non-thinking instead of not thinking. Non-thinking, there's somebody that sustains you. That is in a book called Beyond Thinking. 
the question becomes, what is non-thinking? There are many interpretation and commentaries in this non in this non-thinking. This is how Norman Fisher, one of the Zen teachers in the, here in the US, understood non-thinking. He wrote, usually our thought is either dull and, and dim or it is agitated. In both cases, thought is being pushed by anxiety or desire. When we do zazen, we let go of all of this, letting thinking simply rise and fall by returning to awareness of breathing and posture. Thinking may be going on, but there's no more pushing. There's just thinking going on, not I am thinking. This kind of thinking is what Dogen means by non-thinking, thinking beyond thinking. That is in his introduction to beyond thinking. I think this is a good, reasonable interpretation, but it is what usually happens when meditation is going well. Any meditation going well, that's what happens to thinking. However, I think Dogen realization is more radical. For this way of understanding is very common in many teachings. My understanding of it is that it is not as much about the quality of thinking but the feature of Dogen's understanding of realization, like the realization of things as they are or as time being. He writes about many kinds of realization. And my understanding is that in true and realization of the kinds he emphasized, it does not matter whether there is thinking or not thinking. Thinking can be going on of whatever quality, but it does not impact the condition of realization. There can be profound thinking, smooth and spontaneous thinking, or simply thinking about organizing one's calendar or no thinking at all. The point is that realization is such that the presence or absence of thought or the quality of thinking is irrelevant for realization. The realization stays the same, unmarred and not impacted or patterned by, these, by the issue of thinking. So non-thinking, the relevance of the question of thinking for real life or the realized condition, like the realization of suchness, seeing the thing as what it is. Ash is ash. You might be thinking, but it doesn't affect the fact that ash is ash. That's my understanding of it. The last thing I want to bring in, which I think is very important for understanding of realization, enlightenment, and realized people. We should the question of delusion in its relationship to enlightenment. Most tradition is usually taken that enlightenment means the end of delusion, that the awakened have no delusion about reality. Dogen differs in some fundamental ways, which helps us understand spiritual realization and spiritual potential much more deeply, which is useful for our times. In the great enlightenment fascicle called Daigo, Dogen writes, what happens when a greatly enlightened person become deluded? This is indeed a question to be asked. Is a greatly enlightened person who becomes deluded the same as an unenlightened person? When a greatly enlightened person becomes deluded, does the person use a great enlightenment to create delusion? This is a beyond thinking by translated by Tanahashi. Another translation from Kim, from Kim, quote the same fascicle, but in this translation he says, is a greatly enlightened person who is nevertheless deluded the same as an unenlightened person? When being nevertheless deluded, does a greatly enlightened person create delusion by exerting that enlightenment? Not exactly the same meaning between the two translations, but close. Becoming deluded or nevertheless deluded, that's the difference, slight difference. And I tend to prefer the latter, nevertheless deluded, for I think it gives the fascicle a greater depth because it indicates that not all delusions are erased by enlightenment. 
Tanahashi's translation has its merits for indicates that an enlightened person can develop delusion. While Kim uh, uh, translation says enlightenment means there can still be delusion. Kim and other look at this as the non-duality of enlightenment and delusion. That one does not negate the other, but the, there is a dynamic interplay between them. I want to take a different direction, which is that enlightenment is not the end of delusion. It is clear enlightenment or awakening, as many people talk about this, the awakening or realization. It is clear that enlightened being can be deluded about many things. For we know that many of the great masters in Tibet and India believed in many superstitions about the world. These are delusions, but this is not the main point, which is that enlightenment or awaken, awakening leaves some delusion about reality, not just superstition about the physical world, about reality itself untouched, unseen, and not overcome. Dogen points to a positive side to this, using the translation used by Kim. Regarding a greatly enlightened person as a nevertheless deluded, you should also investigate whether the nevertheless deluded means fetching another piece of a great enlightenment. In any event, you should know that to understand the great enlightened person and nevertheless deluded is the quintessence of practice. Very interesting thing, actually. Here is Tanahashi's translation. It gives a slightly different flavor. Or is it that the greatly enlightened person becomes deluded, means delude, delusion, brings forth another great enlightenment? You should stud, study thoroughly in this way to inquire how a greatly enlightened person can become deluded should be the ultimate point of study. I bring my understanding here. My understanding from, the, from direct experience is that awakening does not exhaust enlightenment. There is always enlightenment after enlightenment. There is always more to enlighten, to discover about reality, what Dawkins calls fetching another piece of enlightenment or brings forth another great enlightenment. This is counter to many traditions that take enlightenment as recognizing the ultimate truth and abiding in it, and that's it. For Dogen, there's no abiding in the same realization. For me, this is illuminating, for it shows that even though we have awakened, there are other awakening, just as valid and true, and different from the previous one. In this respect, to finally be certain that the realization, for instance, of pure awareness or consciousness, mean there are no more delusions about reality, will mean not being open to Dogen's realizations. It means that the belief that non-dual pure awareness is certain final enlightenment has the delusion of such belief. The belief in that, the certainty in that the, the pure awareness is the ultimate reality and that's it, is a delusion from Dogen's point of view. It indicates actually a mental belief and position that reality does not say about itself. Reality doesn't say that. Pure awareness doesn't say I am the end. The same token, to take the uh, Dogen enlightenment that the time being for them, as final means the presence of delusion that does not recognize that non-dual awareness is enlightenment too. To put it more plainly, we do not know what we do not know about the possibility of enlightenment. This lack of knowing becomes delusion. Meaning as we are awakened, we know reality. However, there are delusion implicit because we don't know other, other realization. But believing we already done is a delusion because there are other possibilities. That's why he says to have delusion means that opens the, door, opens the door to new realization. That's why he says the essence of practice. 
for it becomes a barrier to being open to further enlightenment. If you believe you're done. In other words, to take whatever realization that is occurring at the moment as the final realization is an illusion. Actually, it's a mental position. I think this is why Dogen took the view of the presence of delusion and enlightenment to form the essence of practice. Continue, continuing to practice can reveal other realization, further sectors, secrets of our true nature. It does not need to intend or intend to, but is bound to if we not take the view that we have no more delusion about reality. We are then open to new possibilities instead of being closed by what we think is our certainty of what reality is. And practice for Dogen is realization and openness to further realization. By recognizing a delusion after enlightenment opens the door to another enlightenment. By recognizing the delusion as a delusion, it all clears the way to a different secret of reality. In fact, in all this talk, in this lecture about Dogen, I wanted to uh, talk of Dogen teaching most to point out that many amazing realizations that are not known by the prevailing spirituality of non-duality, pure consciousness, and so on. The Shobo Genzo includes many other realizations different from what I have discussed, and I don't understand many of them. So that's why I brought in this last understanding about uh, delusion and enlightenment, that there is delusion when there is enlightenment, because this shows us that there are other kinds of realization. And that is what I attempted to do in all those lectures, each one presenting realization doesn't mean it's a different perspective of the same realization. No, it's really different. Reality appears differently. To experience reality as a pure awareness is not the same thing as recognizing ash is ash, and you recognize ash as ash and its ashness. Two completely different views of reality. Okay, so now we have 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I have a fundamental question to ask, and it is, what role does memory play in time being? I mean, Do I don't know if Dogen does discuss memory, so I don't know what role. Time being, you see, being time or recognizing that each moment includes all being in time doesn't mean that you're remembering other things. All, all time is not remembered, it is already here. It never, it never left. And the future is already here. Not that it hasn't happened, it's already here. So the, the time being means that all time is always here at each moment. It's not a question of memory. In fact, that might explain memory if you want to elaborate on it, you see. Because time is always here, the past is always here, might be in fact, without that truth, there might not be memory. I mean, Dogen doesn't get into this, that's my own elaboration. Well, change requires memory. Time is dependent on change. And so the idea of time is functionally dependent on memory. Otherwise, what do we mean by time? Yeah, of course. Our usual understanding of time is that it is a progression, right? There is a, a reality transformed from one thing to another. And then from that, we say there is time. And Dogen doesn't negate that. He, in fact, he differs from non-dual teaching who say time is a concept, time is a true thing, is timeless. And he said, no, there's time. There's a passage of time. However, even though time passes, at the same time, time is all of time is always here.
Well, that requires an idea of a uh, another dimension in which time and space are all together, and and uh, exactly. our consciousness, our consciousness just processes through it. That is the realization that all time and all space are always here, in the first moment and the first place. Same place, the same moment. It is a different view. It, it, it is actually an experience, not a thought. It's not a philosophy. You can actually experience that. At each moment, there is the time passes, but each moment contains all the time that passed and that hasn't come. And it's not like you see all the details of what happened. It's just more of an intuitive recognition that all is here. Hmm. And but it can give you the possibility of looking into the past or into the future. You have that realization. Good answer. God bless. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you. Good talking to you. Hamid, my question is, if I'm remembering how I worded it, how would Dogen differentiate or define timeless, the eternal, the infinite, or would he in his realization uh, of the time being, of time being? I'm, how, how do I don't we know. I'm not aware whether he discussed timelessness or infinite. In fact, he says, reality the, is and the bright one bright pearl he said it's not big or small it's not infinite or finite so when you think about it the human experience even in the non-dual teaching we could experience uh, space as infinite or in, uh, in reality we it is a mental extrapolation because we cannot really see infinitely. It feels that we're seeing infinite. Like you look into the blue sky, it looks it goes on forever. But we know it doesn't go on forever. Exactly. So yeah. just more of our own concepts in this dimension. Yeah, I mean, Logan doesn't say there is no infinity, but he says, you know, a single thing is, or the whole universe is not finite, is not big or small, because the question of big, because infinity means bigness or extension forever. He said that sort of reality is not like that. You cannot say it is big or small. Because really, big or small are conceptual dichotomy. Infinite and finite are a conceptual dichotomy. Reality itself doesn't say that about itself. Thank you. I appreciate that, that answer. Thank you very much. Very good. You're welcome. When I listen to several of your lectures here, especially this yeah. one on Dogen, yeah. so, and I had a specific thing that I'm going to come back to. Yeah. But, with each point, when we're dealing with suchness, when we're dealing with impermanence, when we're dealing with enlightenment, yeah. when I go to, uh, I always try to approach things through a neuroscience perspective. And in my understanding, the brain is so busy, not the mind, but the brain, structuring things. It's creating a reality. It's almost impossible, uh, in my understanding of neuroscience, for what's called priming, where from the old impressions, it's overlaying on our nervous system. And it creates a priming which is anticipating, creating connections, um, is structuring reality. And that's all happening in the default mode network on one level. So I think when we're talking about this, that default mode network, Dogen and his Zen approach is asking that to relax. But then instead of focusing, if you're thinking like a scuba diver, you can look up to the surface and the waves. And that's what Zen seems to be doing. When we're in that clearer, uh, small focus of awareness, we're focusing up towards the suchness, towards the surface, towards the waves, towards this reality outside. And 
in the larger one, when you talk about Brahman and the, the, the huge, then we're pro looking down into the depths. It's like awareness of awareness going down. So I'm just interested, I know, because you have a background in uh, physics and all that, um, but from that neuroscience, it seems like we're trying to slowly relax that priming function in the nervous system. And as I do that in the Zen, when I sit in Zazen, that suchness can develop. It's not denying that. And some of what you said with Dogen seems he's holding both of those positions a little bit. But I'm just interested if you have any comments on that suchness in terms of on any understandings of neuroscience, because that sort of anchors it uh, for me more and that sense of priming. Thanks. Well, all of our experience of consciousness goes through our nervous system and brain, all of that. So all that obviously involved in it, how it actually works in those realizations, hard to tell because nobody has really investigated these things in any thorough way. And um, in some sense, uh, the brain creates time, the concept of time in some sense, by arranging things in a way. And uh, Dogen doesn't negate that way of experiencing time, that time passes. He just says there are other ways of experiencing time where that time, in fact, in uh, his uh, fascicle, OG, he talks about time passing from the past to the future, but he also talks about time flowing from the future to the past and time flowing from the present to the present. So for him, time is a very fluid thing. And at the same time, all of time, the main and the point, point, point I referred to mostly is that all of time is right in this moment and can be organized by the brain and it needs to be organized for life in a certain way as past, present, and future to be able to operate as an individual. Now, I also wanted to say that uh, by me bringing Dogen and his kind of realization of Uji being time, that all time space is all here, which is different from non non dual. It's not the un, you know, the onion of you, which is take one layer after another until you get to the bottom of it, which is the Brahman or the emptiness of the Buddha. He doesn't do that. He, he's a, what I call a turnip view. Turnip doesn't have layers, just it is what it is, right? I'm not negating the other view. I'm not saying the, the, the Advaita Vedanta is wrong or that, or that uh, 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 the view of non-dual Buddhism like Dzogchen is not true. No, these are true. These are ways of experiencing reality. And my view is that reality can be experienced in many ways. Uh, Advaita Vedanta has gives us one way of experiencing reality, and it is liberation. Dzogchen gives us a way of experiencing reality, and it is liberation. Dogen gives us another way of experiencing realization, and it is also liberation. And they're different, and we cannot really try to relate them. They might not be commensurate with each other. However, each one is true and valid, and each one is complete in the sense of being full realization that bring in liberation from, um, from suffering and conflict. And that is the beauty of it, that reality is so rich. That's why I said I open up, I want to open up the view of spirituality. Instead of just seeing it, that spirituality is some kind of spirit that appears some way. No, even the ash, recognizing an ash as an ash, and, and if you see it for what it is, it, bring, it, it goes in into all of the universe and it brings it all there. That is an interesting way of, of, of spiritual realization. And I, I really appreciate and feel a tremendous love for you, Hamid, and really bringing that uh, clarity. And it just seems that it's so hard to get out of that neural overlay and yet uh, Dogen seems to be out of it and appreciating many different levels, you know, at the same time, which is what you're pointing 
me and us towards also. I think it will be interesting in neuroscientific research to see what happens to the brain when one is in non-dual realization of the Brahman or, or the Dharmakaya, and what happened to the brain when one is experiencing the suchness of Dogen, like see, seeing, you know, the right. blade of grass is all of reality. Is it a different part of the brain or the, or the or what? That would be an interesting thing. One of the things that Richie Davidson found is that the Dzogchen, and now we're not talking about Zen, which yeah. is so interesting yeah. to try to get those distinctions and the sophistication of our techniques to look at that, but even there we're structuring it in a way, is that yeah. there were gamma waves that are sweeping through the whole brain and integrating all the different neural connections at the same time. And that was one of the findings with the Dzogchen meditation. They almost missed it because it was in all of them, so they didn't see it until they looked at other people who didn't have that there all the time, but only occasionally had that larger holding of everything. But again, thank you uh, so much. And I really appreciate this series. Yeah, I, I like enjoying them too, but I'm glad you're enjoying them. <laughs> thank you, Raphael. Um, we are three minutes to the hour. Hamid, uh, what do you think about one more question? One, one more question, I think, will be fine. It's good yeah. to have a question. I wish we had more time for a question. Yeah. I have one really beautiful question, uh, in mind, but I couldn't find the person who asked it. So do allow me to read it because okay. it's a beautiful question to finish. It's from Carolyn Kelly, and she's asking, is there a quality of love, kindness, care, matter that is really apparent, whatever its meaning is, in this realization of Buddha nature, as you've described it in Dogen? What would feel uh, that would feel like a refuge uh, in the drizz in in the sorry in the dizzying disorientating experience of impermanence, uh, the myriad things. Does this question make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, I mean it doesn't come up usually in the writing or the teaching of uh, you know of the time being about love and uh, kindness and all of that. Although Dogen is known to be a loving, kind teacher, although a strict teacher at the same time. And uh, people don't think of love when they think of, of Zen. However, I think when you consider the realization of all beings being you and your heart, if you experience that your heart and you see your heart includes all being in the whole universe, you are very close to everybody. People think that if everybody is inside my heart, it's going to be crowded. Actually, you know, all being in, in the whole universe are in my heart. They, they are not crowded because the whole space is there. All the whole, the whole infinity is there, a compact is in one point. Mm -hmm. That brings about an amazing kind of intimacy that is much more profound, actually, than other kind of intimacy. And that intimacy can bring, in my experience, different kinds of love. It, it takes love to a different level. Actually, it brings in the essence of love. Why love has this quality? When you love somebody, you want to go, go close to them. You want to be near them. Why? Because of this what's called interpenetration on absolute, which means you want to be one because you are really one. You are not separate in some kind of, in, you know, in, a, in the way that Dogen's talking about it. So and that's for me, that is really not just love, it's the essence of love.